Uh, all right. Hey, Scott, it's fabulous to have you here. Yeah. So tell me a little yeah. bit about how quantum computing has shaped your understanding of the meaning of life. All right. Well, uh, I should say, first of all, that, you know, I think the meaning of life is something that we have to find for ourselves, uh, you know, for each individual and, you know, also uh, for the whole species to the extent that there's any meaning to the life of the species. I don't think that by investigating some technical question about quantum computing, someone is going to say, aha, so there was the meaning of life. Okay, but having said that, uh, uh, you know, uh, for me, you know, the meaning of life it, it personally is, is uh, inextricably bound up with the story of the Enlightenment, with, you know, broadening our circles of empathy and also uh, learning more and more about the world around us. And certainly uh, physics and math and computation have been an inextricable part of that. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, my, my work, uh, most of it is about uh, the theory of quantum computing. So, um, you know, this is, uh, 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 you know, just uh, 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 what you could or couldn't compute, you know, in light of the laws of quantum mechanics that were discovered in the 1920s. Now, the link, the, the, the ink was barely dry on, uh, uh, you know, uh, Heisenberg's and Schrodinger's papers uh, setting out quantum mechanics before people uh, st started speculating, well, you know, maybe all of this has something to do with these, you know, eternal uh, philosophical questions about the meaning of life. So, for example, you know, quantum mechanics says that some events are fundamentally indeterministic, you know, not just because of our lack of knowledge of uh, uh, the uh, initial conditions, but just, uh, uh, you know, as, as an inherent part of uh, uh, the rules. Uh, so, you know, could that have something to do with free will? Right, uh, quantum mechanics also famously says that uh, 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 measurement sort of obeys a different rule from everything else. So when you're looking at a system, it sort of undergoes a violent uh, 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 discontinuous collapse, uh, 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 which is different than when you're not looking. You know, uh, does that so does that mean that physics now finally has something to do with consciousness? Now I think that uh, the um, the modern point of view has sort of uh, uh, um, has 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 left a lot less room for those sorts of speculations uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, we we understand you know uh, very well now that uh, the indeterminism of quantum mechanics is you know uh, 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 completely random in character, right? That is, it's, it's probabilistic. You can always calculate exactly what is the probability that a given, you know, radioactive nucleus will decay, for example. So if you had a, you know, a huge uh, a collection of nuclei, you know, you know, almost exactly what fraction of them will have decayed by a given time, right? And that just seems very, very far from most people's conception of free will, right? Which is not that there's some, you know, cosmic roulette wheel, you know, guiding their choices, but that, you know, they chose, you know, uh, so to speak, and, and uh, no one in advance could have even have calculated the probabilities, you know, in the same way that they could do for the nuclei. Um, and regarding uh, uh, consciousness uh, collapsing the state, I think, you know, the modern point of view uh, emphasizes decoherence, which is a sort of interaction between a quantum system and its, ex and its larger environment. And it basically says that sort of any interaction with the environment will produce you know, the same effect as if a, your system was measured. So uh, from this perspective, it doesn't have to be a, a person or, or even a, a dog or a frog for that matter, or any conscious being that's uh, uh, observing a quantum state in order to make it collapse. It could be any stray particle passing through the system that carries away information about its state. Uh, you know, uh, that would cause it to undergo what's called decoherence. That is, you know, loss of its quantum superposition state. Uh, incidentally, decoherence is exactly why it's so hard to build a useful quantum computer, because it's as if uh, the environment is constantly trying to measure the quantum computer's state and force it back down to being classical. Um, to the extent that quantum mechanics does have anything to do with these ancient questions about free will, I think it's mostly because of the question of predictability. That is, uh, could you predict uh, what someone is going to do before they do it? You know, could, uh, 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 you know, okay, so, so today, 
you know, of course, you know, uh, psychics and uh, advertisers, you know, and politicians try their best to predict people's behavior. And they can do it some of the time, but, you know, clearly not, not all of the time. You know, uh, uh, you know, the last few years have, uh, uh, for, you know, good and, and uh, largely for ill, have shown us very dramatic events that almost no one predicted, right? So, uh, uh, um, you know, so, but, but we could ask about, you know, what about in some remote science fiction future, right? Uh, uh, could, you know, nanorobots go through your brain and just scan, uh, uh, you know, completely scan its state, upload that state to a computer, and then anything you're going to do, any poem you're going to write, you know, uh, any uh, uh, interview you're going to give, like this one, you know, the computer in the next room would predict exactly what you were going to say before you said it, right? Well, uh, you know, that's possible, you know, we can't rule it out, but, you uh, uh, it, it sort of depends on um, uh, uh, sort of what, uh, 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 just how uh, detailed that sort of brain scan would have to be. And one thing that we can say is that if it would have to go all the way down to the molecular level, then a uh, basic property of quantum mechanics, which is called the no cloning theorem, you know, puts a fundamental limit on how well you could possibly scan someone's brain without destroying it in the process. So in that sense, you know, you could say, you know, if, if the molecular details of our brains actually matter to our identities or to making us who we are, then we all have a sort of uh, individuality or, you know, uniqueness that we wouldn't have had if we were just composed of classical information, right? There's, you know, you can't, you know, even with uh, 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 science fiction technologies of a billion years from now, you know, without violating quantum mechanics, you couldn't make an exact duplicate of someone that will do uh, uh, all of the same things. You know, you could teleport them from one place to another, but even teleportation would necessarily destroy the first copy uh, of the person in the course of creating the second copy. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't know uh, uh, if this is, you know, uh, terribly enlightening about the meaning of life, but, you know, if quantum mechanics does have something to say about the meaning of life today, you know, I, I think may, maybe it's along those lines. That's awesome. So I have another question for you. Yeah, so, sure. Much more on the popular side of things. So yeah, sure. Um, a lot of people are sort of talking about this whole concept that we're living in some kind of matrix, that the whole thing is a simulation. And mm -hmm. in fact, you know, a popular question on the quantum state of things might be that maybe that simulation runs out of decimal points, and that's why mm -hmm. it doesn't bother computing things down to the, you know, subatomic mm -hmm. level, and you end mm -hmm. up with this quantum state. Yeah. Another possibility about, um, you know, that, that simulation is the fact that, again, it doesn't bother computing pretty much everything unless somebody observes it. And this mm -hmm. whole concept of, you know, an atom running through, and now you have encoded something about that system, yeah. which says yeah. that you can now maybe the matrix is like, ooh, oh, somebody's mm -hmm. about to observe mm -hmm. that or learn something about that. Let me mm -hmm. determine the state of that thing that I had previously not computed. Mm -hmm. Please don't that. Well, okay. Well, th there's this popular image that quantum mechanics just means that nature is fuzzy at the subatomic scale, right? And if that was like how it was, you might think it would mean that nature would have to devote less computational effort, okay? But the modern point of view, I think, uh, suggests just the opposite. Okay, that in order to reproduce the predictions of quantum mechanics, nature actually has to expend much, much more computational effort than it would have uh, if, if, if the universe were classical. Okay, and you know, the, the sort of example, you know, par excellence of that is a quantum computer, right? Uh, if you built a quantum computer, then, you know, in order to predict its output, you might have to, for example, find the prime factors of a million digit number. Right. That is something that uh, many of us believe uh, uh, or conjecture would take longer than the age of the universe with any classical digital computer. OK, so uh, so 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 quantum mechanics actually makes nature sort of larger. It makes the space of possible states uh, exponentially larger. You know, I, I'm not using that as a figure of speech, I mean, you know, literally exponentially larger uh, than, it, than, it, than, it, than it would have been in, 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 in classical physics. And so, so, the, so the problem that it suggests is quite different, actually, that uh, if you imagined, uh, you know, that we're in a matrix, but it's all being run on some classical computer, well, that classical computer would, it seems, have to do exponentially more work 
than uh, you know than, than 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 you might have naively thought, right? Like you know there are um, let's say ten to the eightieth subatomic particles in the observable universe, something like that. Uh, if you went all the way down to the Planck scale, maybe ten to the one hundred and twenty-two uh, bits of information in the observable universe. But because the universe is quantum mechanical, to simulate the whole thing that we can see, you may have to store more like two to the ten to the one hundred and twenty-two uh, complex numbers. Uh, okay, well that answers a few uh, questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, so look, I mean, you know, the 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 hypothesis that we're living in a matrix. I mean, you know, the you know the the main thing for me is that I want my hypotheses to pay rent and do some explanatory work. Right. And so I feel like, you know, case one is that, you know, there's some bug in the code and, you know, we could sort of detect the bug or something. You know, then it's, it's almost like, uh, you know, it's, it's a religious hypothesis. Right. We can put it side to side next to, you know, uh, 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 Zeus and Allah and, you know, all the other religious hypotheses. Right. About, you know, who created our universe and why. Uh, the second possibility is that, you know, these simulators, uh, you know, who created our matrix belong to some, you know, realm that's metaphysically inaccessible to us, even in principle. But in that case, a scientist will always have the impulse, why not just slice them off with Occam's razor then? Yeah. 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 Um, the last topic I want to touch upon is you, yeah. you basically mentioned your definition of the enlightenment, which is the whole concept of enlarging our circles of empathy. Yeah. And you as a scientist have not only done science, but mm -hmm. you've also disseminated these extremely complex ideas for the masses through a very, very popular blog. So my question to you is, do you see that dissemination as part of these enriching and, and you know, enlarging our circles of empathy? And could you define more sort of how you see these concepts connecting? Well, I hope so. I mean, I would like to tell myself that I write my blog for the good of the human race and, you know, for the, for the enrichment of uh, our entire species rather than just as a means of procrastination or whatever. But, uh, <laughs> and you know, for your I'm, book, not, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the truth is. But look, I do think that outreach is just a fundamental part of being a scientist right it's not something that you like put on your nsf application because you have to you know fill in that thing right it's just uh you know of, of, like like of, uh, of course you want to tell people about what you're doing if, if 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 it's interesting and if it's not interesting well then why are you doing it and why not switch to something that is interesting all right, so the last concept that I'm going to touch upon yeah. is the meaning uh, at a much more human scale, Yeah. Uh, even though in my view you're a little superhuman, uh, but, but about your own life. So basically, yeah. uh, you know, what brings meaning to your life? You have an amazing daughter and now an amazing son and wife, and you have, you know, the job of a dream, and you have awesome students, and you do great science, and at the same time, in this popular book, you have... Uh, you know, this popular blog, um, what have you not done? What's left to do? And, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, next? I mean, I, 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 I ask myself the same question looking at you. I mean, you know, you look, you look, Manolis, you've been an inspiration to me for more than a decade. Okay. And I feel like, uh, uh, you know, like, like you, you know, tra traveled around the world, like, and, you know, published in nature papers and, you know, discovered cures for cancer like before I've gotten out of bed in the morning. We're so. still working on that. <laughs> no, but, but still, you as a person, yeah. so yeah. what fulfills you? How would you balance these things? You know, basically, uh, you need all of them? I think, it, the, I, mean, I mean, the truth is that it's increasingly hard to balance them, right? So, you know, I blog less than I used to just because, you know, I, I uh, with two kids and with uh, recruiting, uh, you know, building up a center at UT Austin, and teaching and uh, all the administrative stuff I do and occasionally even research. Uh, you know, I just, uh, I don't have as much time as I used to. But, uh, you know, I would like to get better at time management. Maybe you have some tips for me. Anyway, uh, Scott, it's been yeah. an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much for participating in this symposium. And uh, I, I hope, uh, you know, to see you in person soon, because I, I look forward yeah, to it. Yeah, yeah, well, we'll co come to Austin anytime, you know. Oh, uh, uh, we'll go for some tacos. I hear okay. there's some good music. So, yeah, and a uh, 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 happy birthday. Thank you very much, Scott. Take care. Yeah.